up, gym owners and department heads? This episode is for you. Today, the Fitness Business Podcast brings in the president of Essential ER, Laura Tolhook, to talk about the importance of KPIs to help smash growth targets. She's a lot of fun, so get ready and learn how KPIs can explain what success looks like. So far this year, it's been five months of amazing shows and fascinating guests. So let's have it. Which show or which guest has brought you the most value so far? Head to your social media page, share it, and tag us. I can't wait to read your responses. Hello, I am your host, Dory Nugent, and the message today is all about the importance of KPIs and who should be doing them. If you aren't having your staff reporting KPIs, or you're not sure who on your staff should be reporting KPIs, gather around your speaker for 30 minutes of education from HR consultant, Laura Tolhook. However, before we get started, we have a quick message from our amazing sponsor, MyZone. MyZone has pioneered unique wearables with talking point technology that makes the difference. Reach more members of your community and keep them engaged for longer through motivation and gamification wherever they choose to work out. In the gym, at home, or outdoors, we're stronger together. Get in the zone at myzone.org. MyZone has been a longtime loyal supporter of the Fitness Business Podcast. I can't thank them enough, so please check out what is new at www.myzone.org. Get your pen ready now for Keep Me's Fit Bizpiration. What are your top three tips to developing KPIs in your business? All right, tip number one. Get your people on board, talk to them, find out what they think that they can accomplish and encourage them to see, you know, maybe they need a little bit more help in pushing the boundaries, but talk to your people and get them on board so that you have their engagement in actually being successful in reaching these KPIs. Second, write it down. Find a system that works. We recently migrated over to Microsoft Office 365, and there's so many apps within Microsoft Teams that can help you without having to go to a secondary dashboard. Same with the Google platform. So find an app that you can integrate or find something simple so that you can get it written down so that everybody is on the same page. Third tip, Book the follow-up. We all have the best of intentions when it comes to KPIs and performance and goal setting with our team. And we build the KPIs and we have these exciting meetings. And then two months from now, it's like, what happened to those KPIs? Six months from now, we're like, oh, we should really book another follow-up. Eight months from now, the KPIs don't even make sense anymore because our business has changed. So book the follow-up, get it into your calendars and don't change the meetings. Make sure that they're happening so that your team members know it's important. Guess who is coming on next week's show? Give up? I got the privilege to sit down and pick the brain of CEO and founder of Premier Team Building, Matt May. Yes, I said Matt May. Now, I want you to get to know Matt when he delivers up some serious fun during our Quick Fire 5 segment. This podcast is brought to you by Hapana. Hapana is a cutting edge membership management solution prioritizing insane engagement. Hapana puts your brand first so you can facilitate deep, meaningful connections with clients and members to book, pay, consume content, and build community. Hapana partners with fitness brands in both the boutique and big box segments that want to drive efficient operations and maximum engagement with clients and members. And they do this by providing direct world-class support with a passionate team who cares about your success. To see how you can transform your brand, go to hapana.com and ask for a demonstration. Hapana, 
engineered for engagement. All right, gang, let's transition into this week's interview. Welcome back for another episode of the Fitness Business Podcast. I'm your host, Dory Nugent. And today I have Laura Tolhook with me. She is a Canadian, which I love having international guests on the podcast. And Laura is the president of Essential ER. So basically what Laura is, is a human resource consultant. Laura, welcome to the Fitness Business Podcast. Uh, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah, you know what? I said it earlier before we started recording. I'm going to say it again. You're fun for an <laughs> HR director or an HR con- consultant, should I say. <laughs> well, you know, my my goal in life is always to be the HR manager that you let's deal with the things during the day, but let's let's go have a beer after. Like that's kind of who I am. So I like to bring that uh, to all of our clients really when we work with them. Nobody likes the book thrown at them and heading out the door. Absolutely. And you know what? I'm so glad that you're here with us today. I think this is going to be such a fun, but yet educational episode for all of our listeners. You are the president of Essential HR. (laughs) And tell us a little bit about what happens at Essential HR. Yeah, absolutely. So we provide HR support. We like to call it HR relief to small businesses. So typically we think of that as people under 50, but we also provide HR support to scaling solopreneurs because that is a great segment of individuals. You're ready to hire and you really need just the support to get it done. Because let's be honest, when you are a solopreneur wearing all the hats, adding a member to your team is not only essential to your growth, but starting that process can be so overwhelming. So we support most of our clients, I would say are between 10 to 20 people, but we also have the services for those solopreneurs as well as the larger organizations. So things like how, how do you deal with, you know, COVID has been a great question. All the questions around COVID, how do I deal with this person who is a second cousin to a person who has COVID and they this person came in with pink eye. Do I have to send them home or somebody keeps stealing the lunches in the, in the lunchroom? What do I do? I mean, we've, we've heard it all and we love it because that is what we do, but also around recruitment, around performance management policies and creation. So really just providing support to the small businesses to make sure that they have confidence in the decisions that they're making. So why is it no matter what job I've worked at, there is always an issue with stolen food out of the refrigerator. I was just saying to one of our clients that I'm like, you, I've never heard of a stolen food issue from this organization. Like it's incredible. I mean, I had one lady who wanted us to pay for a new coach purse because the person in the locker above them, their water spilled. And and so it's like, you know, what can you hit me with now? Bring it on. This is fun. (laughs) Well, this is fantastic. You know, for me, and I'm sure a a lot of our listeners out there, we're going to talk about KPIs using uh, key performance indicators to smash growth targets. And KPIs for me are a love-hate relationship. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure I'm not the first person to say that. So my first question today is, could you explain to all of our listeners out there the definition of a KPI? So KPI sounds really scary. It sounds like something some you know, ivory tower HR department has put together. But at the end of the day, a KPI, all it is, is explaining what success looks like in this role. So it doesn't have to be scary. It doesn't have to be formal. It doesn't even have to be you know, extensive, but it's knowing for you as the business owner, what success looks like. So you can accurately and clearly give that information to your team members. The KPIs tell the story. Absolutely. And when there are KPIs that aren't being hit, there may be more to the story. So perhaps that aspect of the job has no longer become the most important aspect. Maybe there's other things that are coming up that are taking over. So maybe that whole job description has changed. And without understanding if the KPIs are being hit or not, we don't really know. Mm -hmm. Now, I can clearly remember the first time I was introduced to KPIs, and I didn't even know what it stood for, never learned where do I start. So I'd love for you just to talk about, you know, when should a team leader introduce KPIs to their team? This is a great question. So I'm going to take it a step back. So when you build a job description for a new team member or for a team member or for a new role in your organization, the KPIs should be embedded right into the job description. And this is why. As a person who's starting a new role, when do you want to know what success looks like in the role? 
do you want to know what it looks like six months after you started, two years after you started? Or would you probably want to know when you accept that job, what success looks like? And I'll give you an example. So say you're hiring a new marketing person for your business and you've done some great recruitment and you put a practical assessment out there and they not only get your brand and they get your voice, but they've created some amazing social media calendars as part of their practical assessment. And then you have them start only to realize they created an amazing social media post but it took them a whole day for one post. And is that what success looks like for you in that role? Or perhaps they should have been posting, like making 10 of those a day. So we really want to explain what success looks like in this role right from the beginning. Now, when it comes to HR, there's best practices and there's reality. And you have to figure out what works for you and your team. So hands down, you need a job description when you have have somebody joining the team so they understand what their role is. I think that those KPIs should be included right in the job description because then you already have set up your performance management and goal setting system. So do, does, a, does a new team member need KPIs? I think so. Are they going to hit 100% of what you need? No. And that's completely okay. And having that conversation is all part of the process. So what about if you just have one employee? So for all of our boutique owners out there that maybe only just have one employee, should they have that one single employee do a KPI? So this comes back to that formal versus informal. And again, we assume KPIs are very formal, whereas it's, does that one person need to know what success looks like in their role? And I would say, yeah, I'm sure they would appreciate that. And it doesn't have to be, okay, Susan, This is the time we're going to sit down and talk about the KPIs of, it's not like that. We know that as small business owners, it's like, all right, Susan, okay, let's figure out what we want to do from, for March. What are we going to hit? What are our goals? What do you think you can attain? It's a lot more fluid of a conversation, but at the end goal is the same. I like how you put that. Absolutely. I I just like your approach on that completely. So what if let's talk about now you have multiple teams. Should the teams have KPIs or do you still want to go with individual KPIs? So it's, you know, great lawyer, great HR word. It depends. Um, If you have teams, there's going to be a baseline. So if you have, you know, customer service associates who are supposed to be bringing in sales, or if you have trainers on your, in your business who are supposed to be, you know, getting repeat clientele, there's a baseline of what you expect. Uh, and if you have, if you don't have that baseline, you know, take an evening with a, with a tall glass of something that you love and just spend some time thinking about it, figure out what your baseline is. And that's going to change based off of, you know, clientele. It's going to change based off of potentially the experience that they have, how long they've been in the role, potentially even their salary, but you, you might have bigger expectations for people with who have, you know, a bigger hand in that revenue pot. So there should be that baseline and it should be clear, but it is going to depend. So if you have a new person who's bringing in sales and it's just their three months, they, they won't hit the same things as the three-year person. All right. So speaking of longevity, what about the business, the mature businesses, the fitness Mm -hmm. club that's been around forever, mom and pop, maybe family owned. Is it, too, is it ever too late to start KPIs? I'm going to take it back to that informal versus formal concern of KPIs. Really. I've done this for 20 years, but there's possibly, or there's potentially, or maybe there's not, you never know. You've already worked it into the system. You've already worked those conversations into how you manage and how you operate. So maybe taking it one step further by formalizing it. So actually talking about it more often, is part of what you can do if you have a a long-term business. If you want to do it, if if this is part of what you think is going to help develop your employees, which it is, and grow your business, which it is, then go ahead and do it. There's There's no wrong time to start. You can get very intricate with KPIs, as you know, but you also can keep them basic and just look, measure basic things, you know, attendance, check-ins, Um, you know, 
Yep. Google low, reviews. Yeah. Yeah. Low key budget items, things like that. So I like that. So now I'm going to kind of get off of the, the KPI in a sense of for individuals or teams or mature businesses. And let's talk about tips for coaching people to not just maybe hit the KPI, but to exceed the KPI. Yeah. So the first thing I would suggest is always, it comes back to communication. When it comes to anything HR related, really at the end of the day, it's just about communication. So having those conversations, removing obstacles, Hey, what's in your way to greater sales? I had a, I had a girlfriend who was in, was in a sales role with a cheese company. And she's like, they told me to stop selling in December because they couldn't make enough cheese. What's in your way to hitting and exceeding your goals? Well, there was no product. So making sure that you're aware of what they might be up against, what protocols, what processes are embedded in your business that could potentially be getting in the way of an individual's ability to hit targets. And then the second part of it is what matters to them? Because if you have, you know, and I, I use sales again, but not everybody is numbers driven. Not everybody has this innate drive in them to see a number and knock it out of the park. So what is really driving a person to do a good job? So I'm going to go back to Gary Chapman. I don't know if you've ever, he he has a great book. It's called the five love languages and they've used it and redefined it for businesses. And it really puts into perspective that people are motivated and feel engaged and feel appreciated in a number of different ways. Some people are money motivated. I'm going to hit those targets because I want that extra $2,000. I can tell you that, you know, if I have to put in another 50% effort for, you know, 10% more profit, I don't know as an employee if I would have done that because I wasn't money motivated. But if you as an as my supervisor struck up a relationship and engaged with me and took me in as like a family and really showed that you you were invested in me, I would go 100% past the finish line. So it's finding out what really makes a difference to your team members and this is where it gets tough. It would be easy if everybody was goal driven and money driven out of that goal. Because then we could just throw money at people and everybody would want to exceed their targets. Finding out what makes people tick that's going to make them exceed their targets is so much more difficult. And that's where it comes back to learning that leadership, learning that management that we might, me in that bucket, not have been innately born with. I love how you look at that. It is so true because what inspires one person is completely different. You've got, you know, John over here that's money driven, and then you maybe have um, a different manager that flexibility yep. is is important to her. And she likes the fact that maybe she can come in a little later, she stays a little later or come in early if she needs to leave early. And I know myself being out there in the fitness industry, that's something that I had to learn because I thought everybody had the same Drive. Drive, thank you. Drive as myself. And as soon as I figured that out, I felt like I became a much better leader. So, yeah. Well, I'll give you an example of our team. I'm not a gift person. You give me a gift, I'm like, oh, cool, thanks. It doesn't resonate with me. And every once in a while, I'll send out, you know, just a little essential oil roller ball or a a mug or, or something to our team members. And the reviews and not the reviews, I have, I have four team members, so we don't get reviews, but the feedback, like, thank you so much. That was amazing. My husband thought it was amazing. And I was like, it it was a rollerball, but you're welcome. But I know it means a lot to them. So I put that in my arsenal, in my toolbox to make sure that they know they're appreciated. Completely. I think we could have a whole show on that. Oh yeah. (laughs) I think it's the four languages of appreciation in the workplace is the name of the book accurately, if I can remember. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, we'll make sure we put that book in our show notes so that all of our listeners out there can, can click on it and take a look at it. Yeah. All right. What's your advice on a superstar performer? How do you effectively coach them to achieve even more? You know, you always have that superstar that thinks, oh, I'm already doing, I'm amazing and I'm great and, you know, nobody can catch me. So how do you coach them to, to shine even brighter. So one of the things that we often do with our employees who exceed expectations is we forget about them. We focus on that bottom 20% to try to raise them, you know, to the 50 
Mark, meanwhile, the person who's at 120 has this, you know, unlimited capability. And we're just like, well, they'll, they'll be fine on their own. They get, they, they know I appreciate them. They, they know, they know I love them. Like, and we don't actually put the time and effort into letting them know. And this is what I would recommend if you think that you give appreciation to your team members and they know how much they mean to your business and how much you know that they are significantly a part of the strategic operations i'm going to tell you you need to do it three times more for them to actually know because things don't resonate with us as employees we beat ourselves up we mess something up we don't we don't make what we want to make uh, we don't hit that target and we will think about that and, and feel like failures. And the one time you say, Hey, good job. I really appreciated that. Takes it a little bit of the edge off, but it doesn't come close (laughs) to lifting us up as much as we should. So over, (laughs) over sharing that appreciation is going to be one of the things that you need to do for your high achievers, because they get it even less, they get less attention because they just roll and they bring in what they need to bring in and we forget about them. The other thing I'm going to suggest as you're challenging these star performers is that oftentimes we assume because someone is great in the role that they're in, that they'll also be great in the three other things that we're going to throw at them. And because they're great at, for example, sales, they're a best salesperson. We also assume they're going to be a great sales supervisor. And so we slap on a title, give them a little bit more money and forget about it. And then wonder why the team members are disengaged on their team or why they're just not doing what you thought they would do. Because we've assumed that they're great at this and we don't support them. We don't give them the training when we put them into a new role with a new set of skills and responsibilities. So as much as somebody is a star performer in their role and you give them a lot of a wide net, um, you don't need to micromanage a star performer. And I say micromanage, but I I don't necessarily think micromanaging is a bad thing because there are some people on your team who want to know A, B, C, D, E. And there are some people who say, let me know what the end goal is and I'll get you there. And both of those individuals on your team are fantastic to have. And managing them is two separate things. So back to the, the, the main question was, how do you get a star performer to achieve even more? Engage them in the process, continue that communication, and make sure that they feel supported when you give them new tasks or new responsibilities so that they're successful. So we have created, because oftentimes you're like, yeah, I'll talk to my people. We're going to sit down, have a 15 minute, 20 minute conversation. And you sit there and you're like, where do I start? So we've created some performance and development questions. So if you're like, I want to start meeting with my people regularly and having this conversation, opening up those doors, we've created a a download with some questions that will get you started. But in this download is also questions that they can come to you with to get answers about their role in development and goal setting. And so we call it very simple performance and development questions, and you can find it on our website. Uh, And I think the link is going to be in the show notes. It will. We'll make sure that we get that link in there so that all of our listeners out there can click on and have the opportunity to download. FEP family, that's a wrap on another episode. Thank you for hanging out with me. Whether you're listening in your car or in your office, I want you to know that I'm grateful to be with you today. And you know what else I'm grateful for? My guest, Laura Tolhook. Laura, thank you for delivering a fantastic episode. Don't forget, Laura's contact information is in our show notes at www.fitnessbusinesspodcast.com or you can subscribe to the show notes and they'll be emailed directly to you. Subscribe to the show notes also at www.fitnessbusinesspodcast.com. After a few words from MXM, I'll introduce you to next week's guest, Matt May. G'day, it's JT here. And I was talking to Blair McKaney, the CEO of one of our sponsors, MX Metrics, the other day. And I gave him a hard time about his company's tagline, defeating mediocrity. 
By definition, that means he's excluding the majority of the market. But Blair just wouldn't budge. He only wants to work with operators who want to punch mediocrity in the face, really smash it. So I've talked to a few of his customers, like Joe Shirelli from Gainesville Health and Fitness, and yeah, it's for real. While Joe is a nice guy, he isn't satisfied with mediocrity either. He's crushing it as well. So I'm still dubious about selling only to operators who want to defeat mediocrity. But if this resonates with you, I reckon you should check them out. Go to mxmetrics.com. But remember, only if you're interested in smashing mediocrity. The Fitness Business Podcast has landed a milestone. As a team, we have successfully hit 1 million downloads. Everyone on the team is super excited and our guests have joined in on the fun congratulating the Fitness Business Podcast. Let's have a listen. Hi, this is Carl at Concept Fitness Consultancy. Um, I was on show number 390. I want to say a massive congratulations to the Fitness uh, Business Podcast on hitting 1 million downloads, which is a massive achievement. Thanks to anyone that has listened to my episode, or if you're going to, thank you in advance. Look, really, really well done. Looking forward to uh, seeing these celebrations at 2 million. Quick Fire 5, sponsored by Hapana. Bucket list items, oh, they can be so good for the soul. That's why it's our first question on our new Quick Fire 5 questions. So let's hear what is top of the list on Matt May's bucket list. Matt May is our Quick Fire 5 guest. Matt, welcome to the Quick Fire 5. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks, Tori. <laughs> and you know what? I'm just as excited to have you on the show as well. We are going to learn a little bit about you. I've got four super fun questions, and then you get a chance to pitch your show that's going to be next week's episode. So let's get started with question one. What is one item on your bucket list? I want to go to Poland because we had an exchange student when I was in high school and in, in the US and he's from Poland and my parents and my brother have both been. And if I don't go on my next trip to Europe, I'm gonna be disowned as, as a US brother. So that is on my bucket list, hitting Poland. I love the bucket list items. This has been so much fun. We have new quick fire five questions and I'm loving them. So, all right, number one, I would love to know whose business brain you would love to pick. Warren Buffett. And I, I, I would say him, originally I was thinking Steve Jobs. I'm an Apple guy, I admit it. But from what I've heard, he wasn't the nicest guy in the world. You know, and I don't, I'm going to get in trouble now, I'm sure. Somebody's going to come after me for saying that. But Warren Buffett, nice guy from up north, from the burbs, built an empire, seems like a nice guy, big philanthropist, and built his own business empire. All right, I'll take it. Great answers. Number three, what is the most visited page on your website? Probably the philanthropic experiences one, at least recently, because as we're going back to face-to-face -face experiences, people want to get together. They want to, you know, party or, or have a conference or meetings face-to-face, -face, but they also want to do give back. So people are looking at what they can do to give back after two years of this crazy pandemic. All right. So how about giving us something? How about you give us your best book recommendation? Uh, <laughs> this, I think it's called Song of Spider-Man. It's about the Julie Taymor Spider-Man musical that was on Broadway um, 10 years ago that was plagued with injuries and problems and kept delaying opening and delaying opening. And de it's a little salacious, but it's very fun. It's a super quick read. Anybody who has any interest in, in Broadway or that story and the whole thing, it's, it's just like, woo, it's a fun page turner. I, I'm not a reader, and I read it very quickly when I bought it. Okay, well, you just had me on the woo. You just had me there. I'm like, well, that sounds fun. <laughs> All right, Matt, are you ready to give us what would be your oh sh moment of next week's episode. Take it away. Yes. Last summer, when I was researching for my short book on take, called Take the Fear on a Team Building, I did a couple of polls. And one of the polls was, 
uh, what do you automatically think of when you hear or see team building? And I got so many answers. A day where I might sprain my eyes from rolling them back too far. Kill me now. Hell is real. But team building is not a bad word. And I'm going to tell you why and tell you how to get rid of those ugh responses. I am signing off from another amazing episode from the Fitness Business Podcast. But first, I want to tell you, be on the lookout for two great shows coming up. First one, Sarah with the Value Proposition. And then next week, I return with special guest Matt May from Premier Team Building. Subscribe at fitnessbusinesspodcast.com so you don't miss a single episode. It could just be the episode that your business needs. Hey, I couldn't do this episode without thanking our founding partner, Active Management, our partners, Keep Me, Mizo, Discover Strength, Hapana, and ISSA, as well as our advertisers, Rex Roundtables, MX Metrics, and Vapor Fresh. We believe what you leave behind is not what's engraved in stone monuments, but woven into the lives of others. Yeah.